review the whole chapter first, and then we'll uh, go into some depths of what the Lord's talking to us about in this chapter. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Hate what is wrong, hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil, but do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that, righteous, leave that to the righteous anger of God, for the scriptures say, I will take revenge, I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Yeah. All right, so, so you have this, this word Bible, right? And so if each letter stood for something, B period, I period, B period, L period, E period. What would that stand for? Bible. Basic instructions before leaving earth. Okay? So these are instructions that have been given to us uh, so that we can live right and be right. And the Bible calls that being a righteous person. But if you don't know what's right, it's hard to be righteous, isn't it? And sometimes, even when we've read this before, we need to be reminded over and over again. God knows that sometimes we forget. And so, when we look at this, these basic instructions, the first thing in this chapter it talks about is being a living sacrifice. And God says that's reasonable. And here's why we need to know it's reasonable. Because in all the pagan cultures down through the centuries, the sacrifice was always to kill something on the altar. Sometimes it was a, a dove. Sometimes it was a lamb. And God forbid, even humans. Just check the Aztecs out if you want to see what that's all about. Brutal, brutal sacrificing of human beings. 
And God is, is he's, he's against all this. God is against killing. We know that. It's in the Ten Commandments. And this is why when Jesus came, he had to send a message. He said, he said, I want obedience, not sacrifice. Some in some religious cults, if, if they sin, they cut off a finger uh, as an atonement. Uh, just crazy stuff. And when I was traveling through France, I met this, there was an older man and uh, he kind of gave me the creeps because he only had a couple fingers left on his hands. And I said, why, why don't you have very many fingers? And he says, well, whenever, whenever I sin, I uh, cut a finger off. I mean, this, this is now, we're not talking about centuries ago. This is now, this, I was traveling through France and this, this uh, monk guy up in, in one of those old French castles, very few fingers left on his hand. And I said, you better not sin anymore. <laughs> Maybe I have no fingers. But see, this kind of thinking, self-punishment, it's, it's, not, it's not the living sacrifice. And remember, if you're, if, you're, if you're harming yourself, it's not the right, it's not the right spirit. And many times people get into this kind of self-punishment thing. And God uh, was saying, what are you doing? Why are you punishing yourself? He said, I already was punished for you. So if we try to punish ourselves, then we don't understand what Jesus has already done. He's already been punished for us. So here, this thing of being a living sacrifice, that's a really positive thing, a living thing. We're talking about today's message being a living thing. See, the spirit from the Lord, Jesus brings life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. So the spirit brings life, but religion brings death. We need to see this contrast. You know, did you know that Moses was called in the Bible the minister of death? Because he brought religion. He brought the Ten Commandments. He ushered in the Jewish religion, and that religion brought death. And then the Lord said, this is a, this is a mess. This is, isn't working at all. We're getting is a bunch of death. So he sent Jesus so that we would have life. So we need to use our common sense when we're trying to deal with things in our life. And what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? You are living, you're full of life, and yes, it's okay to be happy. Some people don't think it's okay to be happy because they think if they're happy, they're going to become a fool. Like happy people are, they think happy people are idiots who do stupid things. But you can be happy and not be an idiot. And so as we go on and we look into this whole thing, and we see what God wants. And, and it's not for certain people, it's for everyone. This stuff is, is simple in principle, but actually doing it, that's a different thing. It's, if you go down to verse 10, it says to be kind, kindly affection one toward another with brotherly love in honor, preferring the other person. So when you're going in a place, open the door for the other person let them walk out of you. When you're getting in a line, let the other person get ahead of you. And uh, just simple things all the time. The Lord, um, I think, if you look at what he's told us to do, he's, he said, when you're a living sacrifice, the way you live your life is you are a good example to others by how you are behaving. <laughs> and you know, sometimes we don't know how we're gonna act in a sudden situation uh, because we don't, we don't know what's gonna come out of us. And uh, I remember I was uh, with a friend downstairs in my basement one day and uh, suddenly a pipe burst and water was just shooting all over the place and I was drenched in water 
I didn't like it and I got kind of quiet. And my friend said to me, now I didn't plan it this way, but he goes, he said, man, I can't believe you didn't even swear when that pipe broke. And I thought to myself, I can't believe I didn't swear either. But see, the examples that we are is just through every slice of life situation and how we handle it. And so when, when you're driving the car and somebody goes by you and they flip you off and you wave back and smile, that's a, that's a good example. Especially if you've got kids in the car with you. And I was riding with uh, three of my, driving with three of my grandchildren and, and this guy on a motorcycle didn't like the way I was driving. And so when he, he went um, by me, he, he flipped me off. And I was going down Nolan Road, he flipped me off. And all the grandkids saw it and they went, whoa. <laughs> and I didn't do anything. But I can tell you, those grandkids went and told their, their parents, this guy on a motorcycle gave Grandpa the finger. Well, what would have happened if I just would have lashed back out? Then I'd be teaching my grandkids to pay back evil for evil. And that's what's in this chapter. And we're going to talk about the coals of fire, too, because that's a misunderstood part of the scripture. It's, it's, it's kind of humorous. Uh, because um, I won't read that part again. It says to avenge not yourself, rather give place to wrath. So when someone flips you off, you don't flip them back. You're giving place to wrath. When someone yells at you and you don't yell back, this is good marriage advice, right? When someone yells at you and you don't yell back, you're, you're giving place to wrath. It doesn't mean you're a weak person. It's a strong person who doesn't retaliate. That takes strength, being a strong person that doesn't attack back. And so it says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says, says the Lord. So if you know God's going to repay, you, you, you can just keep your mouth shut. Um, it says that a wise man is a few words. If you want to be a wise person, uh, don't talk too much. Don't talk too much. It gets you in trouble. So, as we go on, I've seen this happen many times, people posting online that they don't like their boss, and then a few days later, I'll see online and says, I guess what, I just got fired. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen this happen, I, you know, right before my eyes, you know, the, the post about how they don't like their boss is uh, quickly followed by a post that they got fired. Somebody wasn't thinking. So it says, vengeance is my, I will repay, says the Lord. And it says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Uh, if, if he thirsts, um, give him drink. And so uh, doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. We'll talk about that. But again, um, I'm getting flashbacks of traveling through France. I went through another part of France, uh, southern France, where there's a city called Carcassonne. And this uh, is a walled city for miles. I mean, huge walls. Nobody can get in the city. Uh, but anyway, uh, back quite a few centuries earlier, uh, uh, the Inquisition was trying to wipe out all the people in this city. And so uh, the Romans had surrounded the, the city, the walls of the city, and they'd been there for about three weeks because they were ordered to stand outside that city so that nobody in that city could get food and they were going to try to starve the people living inside that walled city by, you know, standing out there and not letting them leave the, the city to get food. And of course, this is a, a brilliant idea because after three weeks, the, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers were starving. And so there was one older lady who, who got this brilliant idea. She, over the wall, she threw meat to all the Roman soldiers. And that was the end of the war. Because this French lady had the foresight. She said, what are we doing here? You guys are starving. You're trying to starve us. And she threw meat over the wall to the Roman soldiers. 
And they all ate the meat and they all went back. And they said, and they said we're not fighting this battle. You see, those kind of wars, nobody wins. And so we don't want to get into those kind of wars. You've heard the saying, choose your battles. This is very, very important advice. Choose your battles. Every battle that comes toward you, you're not supposed to fight. You're not supposed to fight every battle. There are many battles you're supposed to walk away from and just give it over to God to deal with. But if you are going to engage in a battle with your enemy, if you are going to do something, the Bible says fight the good fight. And how do you do that? You do good to your enemy. You do something good for them. And some people don't understand this, this phrase here when it says, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If your enemy uh, thirsts, give him drink. For in doing so, you shall heap coals of fire on his head. A lot of people think, yeah, they're taking it literally. I want to dump a bunch of coals on that guy's head, burn his head off. That is not a literal scripture, obviously. But what the coals of fire represent because did you know they talk about coals of fire in the book of Isaiah? See, Isaiah was a guy who had, a, I mean, we, we think that he's a prophet of God, right? But Isaiah was a potty mouth. The Bible clearly states that Isaiah, uh, I don't know what he said, but he said stuff he shouldn't. And when God chose him to be a prophet, it says, in the book that Isaiah said, God, did you choose me as a prophet? He says, I am a man of unclean lips. What does that mean? He probably swore a lot, probably said a lot of things he shouldn't say, right? And, and so, you know, God picks unlikely people. So he picked Isaiah. And here's how we can understand about the coal, okay? Because I want, I want us to have an understanding of what the coal is in the Bible. It says that an angel went to the altar of God and took a live coal off the altar of God and laid the coal on Isaiah's tongue and his tongue was purified and from that point on Isaiah didn't swear anymore he didn't say things he shouldn't say and he always said the right words at the right time because that's what a prophet is is somebody who God is talking through so if in your past you've been a potty mouth or you've said a lot of nasty things. No worries because God can transform you into his oracle. And in the Bible, an oracle is a person who God is talking through. We are all called to be oracles of God. So don't look back on your past and say, don't be like Isaiah and say, oh, I can't be an oracle because you don't know the dirty jokes I've told over the years. No, God, when he calls you, he equips you and makes you able to do what you need to do. And he purifies you and he purifies your mouth and your speech. But when we go back to this, so then we see that what is the coal of fire do? The coal of fire purifies. It's fire that purifies. It's a spiritual fire. It's the fire that comes off the altar of God, a holy fire that purifies. It's not the earthly fire that the natives worship. That fire will burn you up and kill you. But the holy fire all through the Bible is the Holy Spirit fire. It's the fire that Moses saw when he saw the burning bush and the bush would burn up. It's a spiritual fire. So when you are kind to others, you are releasing a holy fire to fall on others by your example. Remember God said to keep being an example so when you keep being the right way and you keep being kind to people and you keep being good to people, you are releasing a holy fire. And the Bible says that when you do this, 
and you heap those coals of holy fire upon the other person's head. It's not going to hurt them. It's not going to burn them up, but it will purify them because what it does, and why is it heaped upon the head? Because it will change the way that person thinks. You might say, well, what if they keep being bad? That's not your problem. You just keep keeping the coals of holy fire on your enemies. And it's, it's for everybody because we all need to be purified. We all need that holy fire. And you wonder if Jesus has anything to do with the fire. When John the Baptist baptized Jesus, he said, I baptize people with water, but there comes a person after me who shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The holy fire. It's awesome. See, there's holy water. A lot of us know about holy water. Some churches will throw it on you. And a friend of mine who was brought up in a church where they threw the holy water on him, right in the middle of service, he yelled out real loud, uh, Mom, that man just spit on me. Oh, no. And he didn't understand what was going on, of course, right? And you can understand if you're sitting in church and somebody came by and threw water on you, you might be a little confused. But this is not a physical thing we're talking about. It's a spiritual thing. And so the purification of the fire of God and the word is like a fire and it burns out the sin just like it did off of Isaiah's tongue. See, Isaiah had a black tongue of sin coming out of a black heart. You say, how do you know it was out of a black heart? It says because from the heart, the mouth speaks. And if your heart is black, your tongue's going to be black too. And you're going to be saying things you should not be saying. But the Lord purifies our hearts. He purifies our minds. And then the byproduct of that is he purifies our mouth. And this is why the word says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. What's corrupt communication? It's just basically anything you should not be saying. And I see people do this all the time. Um, I, I, I heard a Christian say, I asked him when the tornadoes came through, I think this guy wanted to retire from his business. And I said, are you doing okay? I, I noticed the tornadoes came through by your, your repair business. And uh, he goes, yeah, the tornadoes didn't hit my business. He goes, I wish they did, because he wanted to retire. But see, when when he said that, I just I just in my spirit just kind of went, yikes! Don't say that. You should be thanking God that He spared your business, not wishing it was destroyed. But see, this is this is what happens when our attitude's wrong. We can actually be wishing the wrong thing upon ourselves. See, if if you're still here, there's a reason. Don't wish for bad things for yourself or anybody else because that's wickedness. Always wish good for others. Always wish blessings upon others. The word says bless and curse not. And you know, in the Old Testament, some of these prophets, they didn't understand this and they didn't have a, a right spirit and they abused their spiritual power. And we, we can see this with Elijah. He abused his spiritual power. And he would curse people and wish bad things upon people. It wasn't right. It wasn't right. So let's look. And so then it says, um, up in verse 17, do we not repay no evil to any person? Don't repay evil for evil. So this, it goes far beyond action because God looks at your heart. And he doesn't want you wishing bad for anybody. I heard a Christian uh, a while back who had left a church. They'd been injured by the church that they were attending. And they were very bitter toward that church. 
And they said to me, I hope that church fails. I hope that church closes. That church sucks. I hate that church. And all this nasty stuff was coming out. And, you know, it would have been better for that person to, you know, have this attitude. If this is not the place for you, move on, go somewhere else, find a place that's your home. But see, we we're not supposed to go around spreading that toxic poison. We've all had experience of, of being in places that have injured us or harmed us. But, you know, it's, it's funny because you're going to have to become your own thought police. You know what I mean when I say the thought police? You could just go with everything you think or you can stop and measure what you're thinking by the word of God. Use the word of God to fight the enemy. Every time the devil came to Jesus, he answered back with the word of God to shut it down because the devil can't answer back to the word of God. It shuts him down. And so if somebody's being an enemy and, and you say, what do I do about this terrible person? You just answer back. The word says, love your enemies. And that shuts it down. All thoughts of payback, all thoughts of what am I going to do about this person? You just, you give it over and the enemy's work in you is shut down. And here's one more before we close on this today. We could go a long time on this chapter because it's very deep and very rich. But you know, you don't have to feel like doing something to do it. You don't have to uh, feel like it. How many of you over the years who worked a job got up when the alarm went off and did you feel like getting up? Or did you want to smash that alarm clock and go back to sleep? Now, if you can do that, then you can do this. If you can get up and go to work when you didn't feel like it, you can do this too. You don't feel like loving your enemy? That's okay. God didn't say you had to feel like it. You just say, the word says... The word says, love your enemy, so I'm going to do it. I'm not going to wish any harm on anybody. But God wants to take it even further. He wants to deal with your thought life. Because this happens to all of us from time to time. It's usually a person who's hurt us in our lifetime or done something that really caused us pain. And that person comes to your mind you may not be saying anything, but they come to your mind and you start thinking about that person and you start going down that road to ruin and you think about how they mistreated you and how they, they how dare they treat me. What, they're an awful person, terrible person, just awful. How could they be that way? And you go down this road and what you're actually doing as you're doing this is you are actually uh, on the wrong road because the word of God addresses this. The word says, love thinks no evil. So why are we going up and digging up all this garbage from our past? And I had a bad childhood and this went wrong and this went wrong. And I'm a, I'm a damaged person. I'm damaged goods. Well, guess what? God can still use you if you're damaged goods. Don't make that an excuse for your life. Have you ever bought a tomato, uh, a, a can of tomato soup that was on sale and reduced price because it had a dent in the can? Have you? They reduced the tomato soup and the chicken noodle soup because they have dents in them. You know why? Damaged goods. But here's the amazing part. There's nothing wrong with the contents. The contents are perfectly good. Gibson guitar would sell off. Guitar's worth $2,000 for about 200 bucks because it had a little chip in the wood and the paint job. The guitar is perfectly good, but they called it a second. What am I saying? Don't make excuses, damage goods. I had a bad past. 
You don't know what I've been through. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. That's my favorite hymn. No, no. <laughs> See, because you may have had the trouble, but that's in the past. And it's so important for us to understand when it says love thinks no evil, how are you going to do that if you're digging up all the garbage from the past? And another thing, it says, think on things that are lovely. These are commands. How are you going to do that if you keep going back to the, all the, the, the unhappy things that happen? We all have that in our past. We all have that in our past. But the closing scripture in this book, it says, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's the key. We're called to be overcomers. Jesus said, I have overcome. Nobody's feelings got hurt as bad as Jesus. They spit on him. They ripped out his beard. They stripped off his clothes. They publicly shamed him. He hung naked upon the cross. But he overcame the evil. And on the very cross, as he was hanging, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was overcoming and we are also called to be overcomers. Don't let something that happened in the past pollute your present. If you want to be free from all this garbage, would you say a prayer with me? Remember, the enemy's always got fresh garbage if you want it. I don't want it. It's time to dispose. Let's just say this prayer. Lord, I thank you for your word. I know that I'm called to be a living sacrifice. So I choose right now to obey your word. I will think on things that are lovely. I will love my enemies. I will invite you to heal all hurts. I release my desire for revenge and I hand that over to you. I ask you to set me free of everything that's not of God. I choose forgiveness over bitterness and I choose to be healed in my heart my mind, my mind and soul. My soul let your healing flow through me now, through me now. And, remain. and remain in Jesus name amen, in Jesus name, amen. okay so that uh, <laughs> that's something you're going to have to maintain it's like keeping gas in your car checking your oil all that stuff you have to do to keep the car running you, this isn't a one shot you have to keep doing it but remember, you do it by speaking the word. And if you start getting a bunch of negative thoughts that try to flood in, just say out loud, love thinks no evil. The word tells me, think on things that are lovely. See, that's a choice, right? You can do this, but you have to make sure that the fight you pick is the good fight. It says fight the good fight. It's a good fight. And when you do this, you will not be an instrument to harm others, but you will be an instrument of blessing. Okay, we're going to end with a couple songs. Kathy has a few announcements as well, but we're going to have a little fun with this today. I'm going to play something different because it's summertime. And... <laughs> I'm going to play a surf song, an instrumental surf song. So uh, get your in invisible surfboards out right now. And we're going to spend the next two, three minutes surfing. Surf's up, dude. <laughs> 